Lord God, if there is anything I can say that would be twisted by sin, may it fall upon the ears of these people like a seed on rocky ground and be swept away before it can bear, before it can take root. But if there is anything I can say that would let your love be heard, may it fall upon the ears of these people like a seed on fertile soil. May its roots grow deep and may it bear within them good fruit. Therefore, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right. Hunger is a survival mechanism, right? It drives our pursuit of sustenance. I would even go so far as to claim that the the senses of taste and smell and sight and even hearing have evolved to help us in successfully fulfilling this pursuit, right? And anyone who's ever opened up a can only to have a cat magically appear at their feet know very well the connection between sound and hunger. Right? Out of all the creatures on earth, human beings have developed a unique relationship to hunger, particularly the links we'll go to to satisfy it. Now, we're the only species that cooks our food before we eat it. The only species that slathers food in condiments. The only species that extracts sugars and fats from some sources in order to add them to others that don't taste as good. We're certainly the only species that cuts radishes into tiny little decorative roses that we use to garnish a salad we're not going to eat anyway. In her book on the spirituality of ethics and eating, food for life, Shannon Jung points out that many Christians in the affluent first world are seldom, if ever, hungry. She continues that many of us do not think of hunger as a normal human experience. And with that, we might also lose respect for just how much we depend on the world of nature for food, or on how much we depend on others for the food to which we have such easy and immediate access. She also contends that losing our sensitivity to hunger for food may make it more difficult to recognize and deal with other kinds of hunger. Right? Food is not the only thing for which we depend upon creation. We also need air and water and sunlight. We also hunger for, for non-physical things, for companionship and freedom and dignity. We hunger for beauty and security. Scripture links the provision of all these things to God's will for our well-being, revealed both in the plan of creation and in God's satisfaction with the accomplishment of that plan. But Scripture also offers a caveat about the potential problem of pursuing our hunger without restraint. My mother tells a story about my older brother when he was much younger, a wee toddler. She happened upon him seated in the backyard with the stem of a toadstool in his tiny fist. The cap of the mushroom was nowhere to be found. You do the math. I can't quite remember how the story ended up apart from a desperate trip to a doctor's office or the emergency room. Did they pump his stomach or did they determine that the mushroom cap he'd eaten wasn't really that harmful? I don't know. But my older brother turned out mostly all right, so let's call it a happy ending. Sometimes our hunger can get us in trouble, can't it? The first three verses of today's Genesis reading offer what Walter Brueggemann describes as a remarkable statement of anthropology. Human beings before God are characterized by vocation, permission, and prohibition. The vocation, till and keep the garden. The permission, to eat from it. The prohibition, except from that tree. The human task, Brueggemann claims, is to find a way to hold the three facets of divine purpose together. Any two of them without the third is surely to pervert life. 
Now it's telling and ironic that in the popular understanding of this story, little attention is given to the mandate of vocation or the gift of permission. The divine will for vocation and freedom has been lost. The God of the garden is chiefly remembered as the one who prohibits. Now any parents in the room uh, might be able to relate to this, right? You put a roof over your child's head, clothes on their back, you feed them, buy them toys, raise them with love, and then you tell them this one time that they can't go out with their friends at 10 p.m. on a school night, and you never let me do anything! Right? It's the prohibitions that we remember, isn't it? We must not lose sight of our calling and the choice we have in responding to that calling because God's prohibition only makes sense in terms of human responsibility and human freedom. Perhaps we tend to obsess over the prohibition because that is precisely what the serpent obsesses over. Did God really tell you you couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? It asks completely misinterpreting the prohibition and inviting a correction from the woman. No, 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 not any tree, just this one. She indicates, if we eat from this one, God says we'll die. The serpent has a foot in the door, and we are to assume at this point that the serpent still has feet because it hasn't been punished to do the slithering thing quite yet. You won't die, it says. Now, Brueggemann offers interesting insight on the initial prohibition and the character of the serpent in circumventing it. Now, though the matter of death, right, had been mentioned by God, it was not the main point of the story. It was not a threat, but a candid acknowledgement of a boundary to life and a healthy one. Now, the serpent comes along and twists God's speech, altering the boundary so that it becomes a threat, transforming the boundary of life into a terror, which puts everything into question. It is not God, but the serpent who has made death a primary human agenda. And by misquoting God, opens up to human consciousness the possibility of an alternative to the way of God. The prohibition had held human vocation and freedom in check by means of the rhetoric of obedience to God. But that fidelity has given way to analysis and calculation, or as Brueggemann is keen to point out, the theological ethical talk of the serpent is not to serve, but to avoid the claims of God. And she ate and he ate, and the couple takes the boundaries of life into their own hands. The prohibition is violated, the permission is perverted, and the vocation is neglected. There is no more mention of tending and feeding. They have no energy for that. Their interest is focused now completely on self, on their new freedom and the terror that comes with it. The consumption of the fruit does not kill them instantly, does it? But it does release a poison into their system, or a parasite, metaphorically speaking. It's, it's the same parasite that still fills us with terror when we confess our sin before God. It's the power of guilt, which works its own destruction within us. Death comes, agrees Brueggemann, not by way of external imposition, but of its own weight. Right? God doesn't kill Adam and Eve for disobeying. Their nakedness and their hiding in the garden manifest the power of death even before the Lord of the garden takes any action. Now, note how from here on out in Scripture... The appearance of God or a messenger of God is so often accompanied by a new prohibition. Do not fear. Right? Fear has settled in our gut like a parasite, tugging at our hunger like a puppeteer pulls on strings. Our hunger has evolved to accommodate our terror. We 
we create far more weapons of war than we do gardening tools. We create artificial social boundaries based on fear of our differences. We consume prejudice and bias like junk food. But does all of this feeding of the parasite in our gut alleviate any of our fear? No. It simply grows stronger. The pursuant stories tell of God seeking to call humanity back to responsibly practicing their vocation within the healthy limitations of life. Right? God calls these people to freedom out of the bonds of slavery in Egypt a very unhealthy and oppressive limitation on life. God gives them new parameters and prohibitions within which to utilize their freedom in pursuit of their divine vocation. And yet, what do we see? The parasite of fear manifests itself in their hunger. They grumble against Moses and against God, that they have been brought out of the wilderness, or that they have been brought out of Egypt into the wilderness to die. And so God gives them bread from heaven. But out of the fear of scarcity, they doubt the promise of provision and don't respect the prohibition not to collect too much. And even then, they continue to grumble, but we're still hungry. We want meat to eat. Right? Other hungers are tested as well. Their hunger for a God that they can see and touch which leads them to crafting an idol, their, their hunger for a land that they can possess and control, which leads them to a willingness to abuse and oppress the people already living there. I won't say much more on the matter, but I do invite you to investigate how the themes of hunger and fear factor into the story of God's attempts to redeem humanity. Jumping forward a few centuries, enter Jesus who is led by the Spirit from his baptism into the wilderness where he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. We are told that afterwards he was famished. Famished. That goes beyond the experience of hunger. One would expect anyone who is famished to submit ravenously to the whims of hunger. But that's not what we see from Jesus the relationship between fear and hunger appears to have been severed or at least brought under control by a superior awareness of and obedience to the will of God. He faces the same temptations as the Israelites. Food in the wilderness. The crafting of an idol, worshiping something else. Take possession of land. But he responds with faithfulness. This passage of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness is intended to interpret his identity as the Son of God, the voice that comes out of the heavens at his baptism. This is my Son. Well, what does it mean that Jesus is the Son of God? So the devil's premise for testing him is better interpreted, as I read, as since you are the Son of God as opposed to if you are the Son of God which Douglas Hare claims is too literal a rendering from the Greek. This word a also means sense you are. And so because Jesus is the Son of God, the devil ascribes to him an unrestricted ability to satisfy his hunger. But what the devil doesn't account for is that Jesus' hunger is not driven by a fear of death, but by a faithfulness to God. Therefore, what it means to be the Son of God is revealed as the one who restores the vocation, freedom, and obedience of humanity before God. Now, consider for a moment how we are, each of us, invited to participate in this reconciled relationship. We're invited into new relationship with God by the very act by which we became estranged from it. Take. Eat. Spoken by Satan, these words fill us with doubt and guilt and fear. Spoken by Jesus, 
These words fill us with hope, grace, and faith. The consumption that invites death is overcome by a death, this is my body broken for you, that invites consumption. Take, eat, all of you. So how can we take this mindfulness with us on our own journey through the Lenten wilderness? Many of us may be taking on the Lenten practice of what I call partial fasting, right? That is giving up on consuming a particular item for the next 40 days, usually junk food. Fasting is intended to be a prayerful practice of restoring our relationship with God by by trusting and submitting to God's will above our own desires. But have we not, as pointed out by the revelation of Walter Brueggemann, merely focused on the prohibition? Can we use our mindfulness of Jesus' invitation to practice fasting, not only as a means of prohibiting ourselves from consuming certain things, but also as a means of giving thanks for the radical permission we are granted to act with freedom. Right? God never denies us access to God's good gifts. Never. We are to responsibly acknowledge the calling to use our freedom to till and keep the gifts of God to give thanks for them. So I I invite you to consider fasting, not purely for the purpose of denying yourself access to the goodness of God's gifts, but fast for the purpose of denying the parasite that lives in your gut, the satisfaction of controlling your consumptive habits. Fast to deny fear the right to possess you. And instead, practice your life giving it over to the purposes of God. What if rather than giving up M&Ms, you gave up consuming that which fuels your fear? What if by practicing trust in gratitude for the gift of grace, you starved yourself of fear? Just be wary that as your fear becomes more and more famished, the temptation to give into it will seem more and more justified. Just remember that there are other things you can consume that will give you strength to endure against it. Every word that comes from the mouth of God. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer a prayer to you at a time of distress. The rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. This is the word of the Lord. Amen.